first step back a little bit. I want to thank the foundation for allowing me to speak here, uh, Dr. Trevino and Joanne for organizing the event here, uh, Mary Lou and all the board members who were present. Uh, we had a wonderful dinner last night. Can everybody hear me? Let me hold it closer here, okay? Okay, sorry about that. All right, what are our goals today? Well, the first goal actually was to get the projector on the screen, so I think we've achieved that already, okay? Uh, what I'm going to do briefly today is review the muscles of facial expression and try to help you understand how these muscles play a role in blepharospasms and what are our targets for treatments. You can feel free to email me at any time if you have any questions. Uh, I'm usually pretty good with uh, returning emails. I may not be very punctual, but I'll eventually get to it. Okay, so let me give you a fictional history and you know just to protect the uh, anonymity of my patients. This is a 44 year old female. She was referred to me by her primary care physician for a droopy eyelid consultation because amongst the other things I do is treat droopy eyelids. This patient has reportedly been unable to work for over two years. She has difficulty driving, focusing, she was referred to a psychologist, underwent months of analysis with no results, was sent to a psychiatrist, prescribed antidepressants. This patient was also denied disability on multiple occasions, saw multiple ophthalmologists, treated for dry eye, not really better and saw other doctors and was told that nothing was wrong with her and go back to work, all right? Now this is where this slide came in here. <laughs> so what does this patient have? This patient, and let me see if I can show this one video here. Uh, here she is here. Can you see this video here? Okay. Anybody see that? Okay, doctors in the audience, not the, the MDs, the, the real patients in the audience. What's our diagnosis here? Blepharospasm. And it's amazing how long it takes patients to get diagnosed with this condition before they come to see us. When I see patients in the room that come in with dry eye and other things, and Dr. Afshari will talk about, you know, the secondary causes, first thing I look at is how much are they blinking? And then next thing I do is I look at their eyes and is there any eyelash, is there any dryness that could be causing a problem? Almost always there's none, okay? So why is this so? Well, these are the muscles of facial expression, and when we go through medical school, we have to learn all these muscles and all the different actions, but the, the face is very complex. There's a series of different muscles that work in concert to move related to your facial expressions, whether you're sad, you're happy, whether you're up here frustrated because your projector doesn't work. I mean, all sorts of you know, muscles are activated during this process. Now, what controls these muscles? Well, there's an important nerve called the facial nerve that you may have all heard of, okay? And this is sort of the master control nerve that affects uh, the muscles of facial expression. And this nerve comes in front and out of the gland called the parotid gland, and it's the same gland that makes saliva in your mouth. And as it comes out, it fans out all throughout the face here to activate all the different muscles of facial expression. And it's this nerve here that is the end mediator of blepharospasm. So the question you might ask is, why not eliminate the facial nerve? Well, I have a lot of patients in my practice who have had facial nerve damage or palsies from tumors, from facelift surgery, or, or what have you. And what happens in these patients is when you don't have a facial nerve, your eyelid starts to sag here, you develop ectropion, where the eyelid pulls away from the eye, your eye waters, it comes down continuously, your vision is blurred, and in some cases, your eye may not even close completely, and that could lead to drying of your cornea, ulceration, and even blindness. So I don't think this is the answer, limiting the facial nerve. 
So let's talk about the orbicularis oculi. Everyone in this room knows this muscle, I'm sure, because you've had to deal with this on a daily basis. It's the muscle that's most relevant to blepharospasm. It's this circular muscle here. And what it does is it surrounds the eye. And it's the major muscle that is responsible for blinking. Anything comes towards the eye, a noxious stimuli, a lash, a hair, a fist comes towards your eye, your eye will reflexively blink to protect your eye against trauma. It's also important for allowing our tears to drain into our tear drainage system. Now this muscle is very thin and it's very unique in our body because if you look in most of our body, right underneath our skin is a layer of fat. And I probably have more than you know, the, the average person here. But in our eyelid, it's, there's no fat that is present there. And I think that's one of the uh, features of uh, using toxins that work well because you just inject it right underneath the skin and it really gets into the area where we want to target. And here's an example of a patient here. Uh, this is a very highly paid model here in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, this is my wife here, okay? No animals will harm during the filming or, or preparation of this lecture, okay? And this is when she is activated for orbicularis muscle here, okay? And you can see, of course, forced closure, eyelid is round. And unfortunately, I had to ask her at 11 p.m. to take these pictures, so she, you know, wasn't in her <laughs> full makeup and everything else, so my apologies here. Okay, the next muscle that is relevant uh, for anatomical reasons for blepharospasm is the corrugator muscle, and that's shown here, the letter B, or this uh, blue arrow here. The major function of this muscle is to pull the eyebrow both down and in towards the nose. And this is the one of the muscles that, you know, men and women all around the world pay millions of dollars every year to have Botox treated for cosmetic reasons. This contributes to those vertical, those up and down lines that you see in this region here. And, you know, they're considered the anger or frown line. This muscle is covered by thicker subcutaneous fatty tissues, and it often takes a little bit more toxin or Botox treatment in that area. Another muscle that is relevant here is the procerus muscle. And what this muscle does is it pulls the eyebrow down, and it actually creates what we call bunny lines, these horizontal lines um, along the um, glabellar region. Again, this is also a thicker muscle. And it's these three muscles that are the predominant ones that really close your eyes and, you know, really affect your, your ability to see and function in daily life. Okay, let's go back to our highly paid model again. This is her in the regular position. Now when she activates her procerus, her corrugator, and her orbicularis oculi muscle, you can see that, of course, the eyelids close here. She develops these vertical lines here from the uh, corrugator muscle, and the procerus muscle brings the eye down, causing these horizontal bunny lines. The next muscles that are relevant are the zygomaticus major and minor. What these muscles do are elevate the cheek, particularly when you're smiling in the mouth, and in some patients they can create dimples, and other aesthetically pleasing uh, facial units. This uh, muscle is covered by some skin and subcutaneous fat. And what happens is when this muscle is activated here, it brings the corner of the mouth higher. And uh, here's that same patient before activation of the muscles, and then after. You can see how the cheek is raised here. Next muscle is the levator labii superioris muscle. And what this muscle does is it elevates the upper lip. It also flares and dilates the nostril uh, and is located here as well. And it sort of forms a transition between the nose and the cheek zone. The next muscle that is relevant for blepharospasm is the orbicularis oris. And this is a, a muscle that's very analogous to the one around our eye. This muscle here closes the eye, and this muscle here closes the mouth, allows you to pucker your mouth. You need it for sucking on a straw or whistling. And then 
before activity, and this is after. Okay. The next muscle that's relevant is the depressor angularis muscle. And what this muscle does is actually draws the corner of the mouth down. And it's very deep to the skin and subcutaneous fat. And here's a good example here before and after right here. I usually see this facial expression here in the household. <laughs> <laughs> That's because my kids are not behaving, all right? I'm number three on the list. <laughs> okay, the next muscle that's relevant is the, the platysma muscle. And what this muscle does in, uh, amongst its other functions is it aids to depress the lower jaws. It draws down the lip and the angle of the mouth, and it's responsible for that grimace. And here's a good example of that activation of the platysma muscle here. Now, Mage syndrome. Has everybody heard about Mage syndrome? I'm sure people in this room have friends and colleagues with that. Is that correct? All right. Well, Mage syndrome is basically two conditions. Blepharospasm, everybody knows about the abnormal activity and twitching of the orbicularis oculi muscle, the cor corrugator, the procerus. And this is combined with oral mandibular dystonia. These are the focal dystonias that affect the head and neck, particularly the lower face. And often you'll get involuntary contraction of the muscles of mastication, the very muscles that we use to chew. Right? Now, I typically just treat, you know, uh, you know upper facial uh, dystonias. Uh, some of the other doctors here certainly treat the lower uh, dystonias as well. And I believe you'll have some good discussions later today about all the different toxin treatments and all the new treatments that are available. Uh, this was my video that was correlating the movement with that, and I don't think that worked, so uh, I'm going to go and skip it there. Uh, I'm going to come back to this other condition here called apraxia of eyelid opening. Now, has uh, everybody heard of this condition? Okay. So this is a condition that we often see in blepharospasm, and it's actually a very challenging condition uh, to treat. You know, of course, your eyes are continuously closing or closing at the inopportune moments with blepharospasm. But in this condition, patients have difficulty initiating that signal to lift the eyelid up. And what we often see in our clinical treatments is a patient who has had blepharospasm, we treat them with botulinum toxin, and of course it should work, but that doesn't quite have that effect. And I think there was a question earlier about frontalis sling in the audience. Um, that's actually a procedure that can be performed uh, in patients with eyelid apraxia because what happens in this condition, and I wish I had the video to show that, the eyes are squeezing, but once you initiate a request to the patient to open their eyes, the eyebrows come up, yet the eyelid, the, the muscle called the levator muscle, doesn't lift the eye up. And by coupling the eyelid to the eyebrow, that actually gives you that extra kick to lift it up. So that's something I think you should consider with your, your doctor in your particular area if you're considering doing that, because I've had it to be quite effective in many of my patients. And again, this is the video that doesn't work, so my apologies. Let me show you another patient here who's had blepharospasm for over 10 years, okay? Uh, and, you know, just so you don't think this is a picture of her with a flash and her eyes squeezing, this is another picture a couple seconds later. Another picture a couple seconds later. And you can tell she's got the, you know, the lower facial involvement, upper facial involvement. She underwent a bilateral eyelid my, uh, myectomy, which I think Dr. Kakawa will talk about later today. Okay? And that is a procedure where we anatomically remove all the muscles I've talked about, the orbicularis muscle, the corrugator, and the procerus. Here's another picture of her here. And this is her three months after her operation. And after this operation, she had so much life. Her friends were just shocked because they'd never seen her eyes in all these years. I mean, this has changed her life so much. Uh, and she's like one of my happiest patients. And she doesn't speak a, a, a word of English. And I actually have a video of her in speaking Spanish in translation, but unfortunately that, that doesn't work, so my apologies there. But it's a great operation and, and one that really is sort of reserved when you're, you fail the toxins. So, uh, you know, eventually the patients here with myectomies, they will still need toxin, likely, but, you know, it's really changed, the, you know, the management of this condition. So with that, I'm going to uh, thank you. 
you're our patients, but most importantly, you're our teachers. You teach us things that we don't know. I had a great dinner last night with wonderful members of the foundation, and they taught me so much about things that, you know, they don't teach you in the textbooks. So thank you very much for your time, and I appreciate your um, support this morning.